Let's go. Ready? The guy from, uh, the guy from the... Engage. That's the one. Now listen. Is it just me, or has everything just gotten futuristic? Everybody has a cell phone stuck in one ear and an iPod in the other. We're all constantly surfing the net, downloading this, emailing that. We use words like Google, blog, and spam. We got robots on Mars, chat cloning in L.A. Now don't tell me you're thinking. It all just sort of happened. That's just plain dumb. All this inventiveness and technological whiz-bangery by accident? Please. There's a much simpler and more convincing explanation. I made it happen. Or rather, Star Trek did. Yes, you heard me right. Star Trek changed the world, and I'm going to prove it. What the hell is this? I thought we were doing a serious science documentary here. You guys aren't from the BBC. And where is Stephen Hawking? I was promised Stephen Hawking. first episodes of Star Trek, a fighter pilot from the 1960s is beamed aboard the Starship Enterprise. He was as shocked as the show's audience were to be. Welcome aboard the Enterprise. The technology all you kids now take for granted was just unimaginable to most people back then. What's going on here? Where am I? What happened? Unimaginable, that is, to everyone except the folks behind Star Trek, who imagined it all, and a lot more. Star Trek dreamt of a future for mankind where we had sorted out all of our problems and zoomed around the galaxy having fun, surrounded by loads of groovy technology and scantily clad women. Good morning, Captain. Good morning. The perfect future. Kevin, this is Scott. Kevin, this is Scott. What we didn't imagine was the effect that Star Trek was going to have on a whole generation of impressionable minds back home on Earth. Thousands of little Earthlings were going to be inspired to try and recreate Star Trek. And this time, for real. Dr. Bones McCoy, caring for the health of the Enterprise crew. The sick bay that McCoy was running at the time was a revolution in the way we think about managing patients. Lieutenant Yahura, the communications officer. Well, the Star Trek communicator uh, to us was not at all a fantasy. It was an objective. Mr. Spock, the Vulcan. Star Trek fans in Silicon Valley, everyone's a Star Trek fan here. I mean, it's, like a, it's like a football fan in Green Bay. I mean, it's sort of, it's part of the, the culture here. As this insightful, compelling, and award-winningly narrated documentary will prove, Star Trek has changed the world and influenced all our lives. I cannot believe I just said that. How much am I getting paid again? So, where to begin? Well, Star Trek was about nothing, really, if it wasn't about space. But in the 1960s, space travel was a lot less glamorous than it seemed on our show. In fact, it was a messy and dangerous business. The Soviet, Yuri Gagarin, became the first man in space in 1961. This nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. Now, the space race was officially on. The newly formed NASA responded by sending the first Americans into space during the Mercury missions. NASA needed all the help it could get. And then, from the heavens, or at least the studios of NBC, came the inspiration they needed. On September 8, 1966, the USS Enterprise cruised effortlessly across the television screens of America for the first time. Audiences were astonished and inspired. And not just by my acting, but by a vision of space travel as it could one day be. Soon Star Trek would become NASA's inspiration, guiding the development of space travel to this very day. You don't believe that, do you? 
Well, nor did I until I saw this. and he said they're going to send a man into space. And that must have been one of the early Mercury flights. And I was, I was thrilled with that then, and I've, I've stayed fascinated with the exploration of space my whole life. But it wasn't just TV images of man's first faltering steps into space that captured young Mark's imagination. Changing channels, he saw a life-altering vision of space travel's future, a future he could be part of. Captain, sensors report we're being scanned. As soon as I began watching Star Trek, I was captivated by it. By the alien ship? No, sir, it's from that solar system ahead. In Star Trek, regular people could go throughout the galaxy, whereas the reality at the time was a few very special men got to make very short trips just a hundred or so miles away from Earth. And so Star Trek really offered a vision of what could be and that was very exciting. And again, it was a vision that people wanted to believe was real. It would appear someone is curious about us. Mark certainly believed that Star Trek could be real, and he wanted to prove it. As a young man with a head full of Enterprise-inspired aspiration, he set off boldly to go where, well, you know the rest. Sometimes I fantasized about what it would be like to be on board the Enterprise, perhaps to have the position of the science officer. Kirk to Enterprise. Hello? Enterprise from Kirk. Hello. Keep locked in on us. Well, thanks for calling. Kirk out. Star Trek provided another medium for me to, uh, in some sense, share my interest in space. With Star Trek as his faithful friend, Mark embarked on years of exploration into the worlds of physics and engineering until as a wide-eyed PhD graduate, he finally landed here at California's NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. JPL is one of NASA's most important installations. It's the backbone of NASA's unmanned deep space exploration, and it was here that the famous Voyager probe was created in 1977. It's not here anymore, though, because it's about 15 billion miles away at the edge of our solar system, heading into interstellar space. Also in the 70s, JPL landed the first craft on Mars, Viking 2. And today, they have Mars rover robots, Hubble telescopes, and other stuff bothering planets and distant star systems everywhere. Coming to JPL, Mark had at last joined the space program and finally could live out his wildest Star Trek fantasies. We're in the control room for a space simulator here at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And one of the reasons I think this is so cool is this room is right out of the Starship Enterprise. This to me looks like Scotty's console in engineering or maybe auxiliary control. Scotty, we're suddenly off course. Check out maneuvering controls. I said hold. We need time for the phase inverters to stabilize before we can activate the matter-antimatter injectors. How long? It'll take at least 15 hours. Get together what you need and beam down here with it. Top priority. Now, Mark Raymond doesn't just spend all his time sneaking off to do Scotty impressions during his lunch break. You see, he's actually been rather busy, well, uh, being Scotty. He's actually the chief engineer of JPL's most sophisticated and cutting-edge missions. He's in charge of multi-billion dollar robotic deep space probe projects. Next year, he's sending his latest creation called Dawn, 300 million miles across the galaxy to say hello to an unexplored asteroid belt, just a meteor shower the other side of Jupiter. 
I've been there. A actually, it's lovely at this time of year. Dawn will be the latest probe to use ion propulsion, a revolutionary new system that uses electrically charged atomic particles as fuel, propelling crafts 10 times faster than if they used regular old-fashioned rocket fuel. Sounds pretty cool. Guess where they got the idea from, hmm? I worked on a mission called Deep Space One, which was the first interplanetary mission to use ion propulsion to travel around the solar system. And the first time I ever heard of ion propulsion was in the Star Trek episode, Spock's Brain. Aliens come to the Enterprise, and before they do their dastardly deed, Kirk walks over to Spock and says, Have you read, Mr. Spock? Configuration unidentified, ion propulsion, high velocity, though of a unique technology. And Scotty says, I've never seen anything like it. And ion propulsion at that. Oh, they could teach us a thing or two. And so the opportunity to connect what I saw in Star Trek as a little kid to what I'm doing now as an adult is very, very exciting. I am 29, now don't be fooled into thinking that Star Trek inspired only one young man growing up in the 60s to join the space program and send stuff into space. No, sir. It inspired just about all of them. Yep, those pesky Trekkies are everywhere in the space program. Hmm, these guys don't look like rocket scientists, though. And NASA folks aren't shy about their love of Trek, either. As a way of a thank you, NASA named their first ever space shuttle the Enterprise. Oh. But back in the 1960s, the exploits of the Starship Enterprise didn't just inspire people tinkering around up there in space. You see, while some young fans were blown away by the idea of going to distant galaxies, others were more interested in all the things we took with us. And some of them would spend a good part of their life trying to make those gadgets happen three centuries before they were supposed to. My favorite Star Trek toy was about to hit the streets. Ah, the good life. Ever since his days as chief engineer at Motorola, Marty Cooper has always known how to relax. But back in the early 1970s, one thing was really bugging him. Can anyone answer the phone? Ah, tip. The world back in uh, 1966, almost all telecommunications was by wire. You wanted to talk to somebody, you had to plug into a wall. In the entire United States, there were perhaps 50,000 car telephones, and even they didn't work very well. Yeah, back in those days, the state of global communications was a bit of a drag. All those missed casting calls, lost date opportunities, and why? The more Marty thought about it, the more he realized there was only one answer. An impossible dream. Or was it? The people are fundamentally, inherently mobile. They move around. They never, never would want to be leashed, tied to a desk, or to their home, or to their office, if they have a choice. One day, during a break from his heavy schedule of pondering, Marty happened upon an episode of Star Trek and a piece of 23rd century technology that would change his life and take the whole world with it. Hi, Captain. And suddenly, there's Captain Kirk talking on his communicator, talking with no dialing. That was not a fantasy to us, although to the rest of the world it was. But to me, that was an objective. Mr. Spahn. Yes, Captain. On the whole layer of these silicon nodules of yours. Be absolutely certain you do not damage any of them. Oh, I think this thing is genius. Explain. Just the idea of, of having voice recognition, where we didn't even have it in the laboratory at that time, and the idea of being able to talk not only to the next 
a floor of the enterprise, uh, but to people on the planet, all of those things are clearly a part of our path today. Thanks to Star Trek, Marty and Motorola had the inspiration they needed to build a telephone that had mobility, a mobile phone. Soon, Marty had cracked it and the brick was born. Now, the very first a portable cellular telephone. Now, this portable cellular telephone was before processors, before large-scale integrated circuits. We had a few integrated circuits that combined maybe several dozens of parts, but there are literally thousands and thousands of semiconductor devices uh, in this box. Uh, it uses a huge amount of current. The back part of this uh, telephone uh, uh, contains battery. This phone weighs 40 ounces. A typical modern cellular telephone weighs four ounces or less. Okay, well, it wasn't quite as cool as the communicator, but it was the start of the communications revolution that would sweep the globe and change the face of human interaction forever. And to think they said it'd never catch on. Yeah, they said that about spandex jumpsuits. Well, they were right about those, though. This stuff about Star Trek being like uh, influential is true. I thought all the Star Trek fans were just weird guys that needed to get a life. I didn't think they were inventors of the modern world and everything in it. And that'd be true. So how come that happened? Well, believe it or not, it was all part of a plan. A plan laid out by one great man. No, no, no. I don't mean me. Star Trek was the brainchild of Gene Roddenberry, an ex-World War II bomber pilot and a Los Angeles police officer. In 1964, Gene pitched an idea to NBC, which he described as a Wild West-style adventure set in space in the 23rd century, but with a twist. You see, Roddenberry wasn't just a TV executive with an ear for a good hustle. He also possessed a quality almost unheard of in Hollywood, something called morality. I'm standing here wondering. What? what? To him, Star Trek was far more than just a TV show. It was a vehicle for his vision of a future, where humans and their advanced technology would march across space. And there would be no war, no greed, no hate, no hunger perfect tomorrow where we would all just get along. In the actual process of making the show and casting it, Roddenberry insisted on these values too. For one Japanese-American actor, George Takai, Star Trek was the opportunity he had been looking for. At last, here was a positive role, free of any kind of cultural cliché. Captain? Well, in the uh, 50s and early 60s, um, Asian-Americans and Asian characters were the enemy. Satan himself. And so when Gene described how he envisioned the show, uh, and true, it was like being a fourth banana, fifth banana, but nevertheless, that vision was what excited me. I didn't have to play it with an accent. I was a vital part of the leadership of that starship. George had landed the role of the dashing Enterprise helmsman, Lieutenant Sulu. Standard orbit achieved, Captain. His job? To steer the Enterprise on its mission of peace and unity. Gene said that um, the Starship Enterprise was a metaphor for Starship Earth, and the strength of this Starship was in its diversity. All on the Starship Enterprise. Each contributing his or her unique perspective, unique talent, unique contribution to making the success of the ship possible. As Abraham Lincoln discovered, the Enterprise was a place of enlightened equality. The most powerful symbol of Star Trek's racial harmony was communications officer Uhura, played by African-American actress Nichelle Nichols. Excuse me, Captain Kirk. Yes, sir. Mr. Scott. What a charming negress. 
For young fans like Mae Jemison, Uhura's ethnic background and very cool job would prove to be an inspiration. Starfleet Command extends greetings to Commissioner Beale of the planet Sharon. I like Lieutenant Uhura not only because she was an African woman on the show, but she was, it was the first time a woman was portrayed as technically savvy and a full member of a crew. It was the first time that it actually happened. And so what that opened up was possibilities. It's easy to be blasé at Roddenberry's ideals now from our vantage point, but racial tolerance was a novel idea for American television in the 1960s. On the streets of America, racial unity seemed a long way off. Gene Roddenberry used Star Trek's adventures in space to offer a brighter future and promote the way he thought the world should be. The show made history in 1968 when Captain Kirk and Uhura enjoyed the first ever interracial kiss to be shown on U.S. television. Star Trek gave us the opportunity to actually consider social problems in this context of a completely different world and how we can learn to get beyond things. And I think that was what really crystallized things for Star Trek. Three, two, one. With Star Trek to guide her, Mae Jameson became the first African-American woman in space when she launched into Earth orbit on board the space shuttle Endeavor in 1992. When I was on the space shuttle during my flight, I would open all my, uh, my uh, sessions with all hailing frequencies are open. Hailing frequencies open, sir. Of course, Star Trek wasn't all about biting social commentary and a crew representing a happy, united Earth future. It was also about aliens. And lots of them. In our adventures across the universe, we would regularly encounter Talarians and Talaxians, Talonians, Tamarians, Teldarians, Tellarites, Torellians, Tiburians, Tribbles, Triblets, Tigerians, and a whole alphabet of others, including the odd Gorn. Whoa! Look at that guy. He's really cool. Well, as for me, Star Trek aliens were nothing more than painted men in tights. To some young and impressionable viewers, these guys were an inspiration, providing a captivating idea of what exotic life forms could be out there. And soon, some Trek fans would devote their lives to finding them. In 1968, the life of one young dreamer would be changed forever after a close encounter with Star Trek. I still have very pleasant memories of uh, grad student days where we were doing our physics homework and it was all spread out over the, the living room floor in our apartment and Star Trek was on the black and white television. The, the emotional appeal of that show, I'm sure had a lot to do with, with the fact that I went into astronomy. You know, there was some sort of primeval attraction about the idea of, of knowing what was out in the universe, not just physically, but also biologically and intellectually. Thanks to Star Trek, Seth Shostak had become convinced that alien life forms did exist, and from now on, he would dedicate his life to meeting them. Now, it's true that the aliens in Star Trek were mostly friendly. At least they were willing to deal with you. Oh, they'd threaten you occasionally with their weapons. But, I mean, they were basically talking on your level, and, and that was kind of appealing. <laughs> So I know what you're thinking, that Seth is one of those guys who stands around in crop circles all day saying, I believe, after one space cake too many. Well, not so. Seth has become senior astronomer at the SETI Institute, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, an organization that worked alongside NASA for 20 years. 
Decades ago, when SETI first got underway, the public's reaction was often fairly skeptical. Look, you know, they're not out there. This is kind of a waste of time. If you want to do this, okay, but, you know, there's no chance of success. I think that's changed. You know, they've seen Mr. Spock. He's clearly an extraterrestrial, and they've met lots of extraterrestrials on Star Trek. So, you know, they're convinced now that they're out there. So now that Star Trek has convinced you all that little green men do, in fact, exist, SETI just has to find them. Using powerful radio telescope receivers the world over, Seth and Seti sweep the skies, hoping one day to pick up a signal from out there. All this intergalactic interference is constantly monitored for signs of life back at Seti headquarters in Northern California. Well, I mean, it's very interesting to see the telescopes, big steel structures and so forth, and those are kind of the, the, the ears, if you will, for our experiment. But in fact, if we actually ever hear the extraterrestrials, it's going to be the brains that hear them. And the brains are not those big antennas. They're the receivers. Each one of these boxes here listens to two million channels at once. Now, what kind of signal might it be? Is it, you know, can these things understand Klingonese, for example? Well, they can't, of course. They look for very simple kinds of signals that tell you, hey, their transmitters are on. With computers doing all the tedious work of listening for alien hailing frequencies, all Seth has traditionally been left to do is just sort of wait and wait, wait and, well, wait some more. All the time dreaming that one day, one day, his Star Trek alien ambitions will come true. Well, Seth, don't worry. They do exist. I should know I was there. But do you really want to meet an intergalactic plutonium pizza, an over-friendly giant frog, or a cosmic cuddly toy? But then again, it wasn't all bad. Yeah, this could work. Okay, so answer me this. Apart from having been inspired by Star Trek, what of all the things we have seen so far, from cell phones to space exploration and even alien stalking got in common? The answer is simple. They all rely on computers. In fact, everything these days relies on computers. It wasn't like that when I was young. In the 50s and 60s, I seem to remember computers were the size of this rock. Then they became the the size of this rock. They were used for boring things like planning nuclear strikes, and then they became used for interesting things like games and emails. You ask me, how did that happen? Because... Now, there were two things that caused the computer revolution. One was the invention of the microchip. Ta-da! The old computers had been so huge, because all their insides were full of thousands of sort of cables and valves and, and stuff. Once the microchip arrived, all these valves and thingamajigs could be shrunk to the size of a peanut. Computers could now shrink too. But what could we do with smaller computers? Well, that's where Star Trek came in. Small, easy to use computers were everywhere in the Enterprise. Do you see where I'm going with this? This is the town of Boulder Creek that lies above the mountains of the high-tech world of Silicon Valley in Northern California. Now, it may look like an average town, but Boulder Creek has one of the most remarkable museums in the world. To find out more, we need to speak to this man, Bruce Stammer. Now, Bruce is just an average country boy. He likes nothing more than tending his livestock, hanging out in the homestead, and dressing like Shakespeare. Now, he may have an interesting dress sense, but Bruce is one of the world's foremost experts in the history of computing. And it's not more pigs he keeps in that barn. Bruce has spent more than 10 years building a collection of computers that span the entire history of the machine's development, from $20 million supercomputers through the rapid development of the personal computers we take for granted today. Reflecting the progress of the biggest beasts in today's industry, and some of the ideas that became extinct. 
His collection got so big that Bruce has turned his shed into a museum called the Digibar. Hmm, so where did Bruce's love of computers come from? I'll give you one guess. That's right. Back in the 60s, Star Trek was telling the world that one day, computers would be multi-purpose, everyday tools. Computed and recorded, dear. With which we might all constantly interact. Computer, you will not address me in that manner. The sexy, technological innovation of the USS Enterprise had seduced the young Bruce Dammer and a generation of computer nerds. When I was a kid, my brother and I used to lie in our bed and watch Star Trek. One of the things we always noticed, and that I always noticed, was Spock, whenever there was something to really be understood, he would go on the bridge over to a console that had like a hooded screen and look in and blue light would shine on his face. Oxygen, nitrogen, atmosphere suitable for human life support. And I always wondered, what is this guy seeing on this screen? While Spock was staring into his mysterious database portal, the rest of the crew could be seen using user-friendly computers in every aspect of their lives. A revolutionary idea that would change everything. Working. So all the geeks in the 60s who were growing up saw that and said, we got to make that real in the 70s, and they did. But it wouldn't happen overnight. Star Trek may have shown early computer pioneers what the future might be, but it didn't tell them how to get there. This would take some experimentation. The first attempt came in 1974 with a whopping great blue box that is widely seen as the first ever personal computer. But it's not quite the PC we take for granted today. It came as a highly intricate build-it-yourself kit, and once you had finished soldering its circuit boards together, users would find that it didn't actually really do anything because software hadn't been invented yet. Yes, it wasn't perfect, but for thousands of would-be tech types, it was a start. And thanks to its Trek fan inventor, Ed Roberts, it had a somewhat familiar-sounding name. So here we have the, the Sputnik for the nerd generation. This is the Altair 8800, named after a solar system in Star Trek. Head directly for Altair 6. Altair 6. Now we're headed back to Altair. I think I'm going to get spacesick. This became the focus of many homebrew and personal computer clubs. Kids trying to figure out how to make this thing useful. And a couple of those kids were Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, and their version of the Altair useful was the Apple computer. And Bill Gates and, and his guys wrote BASIC, uh, the language for this thing, and they created a company called Microsoft. So the modern world came out of this unassuming blue box. And the rest is Star Trek history. Armed with their Star Trek visions and very big brains, young enthusiasts like Bill Gates took what they had learned from fiddling around with Altair and set about bringing the personal computer into all of our lives. The guys went on to found Microsoft and Apple, Silicon Valley and the PC industry completely changing the whole world, making everyone rich beyond their wildest dreams. And, and, and what thanks do I get for inspiring all this? Where's my cut? I, I, I don't see it in my contract. Well, actually, we did get some credit. In 2000, another one of the computer world's nerd giants, Paul Allen, one of the world's richest men, opened a science fiction museum in Seattle. Pride of the place? My old captain's chair. He bought it on eBay for a reported 100,000 bucks. And it didn't stop there. Last year, his company, which really is called Vulcan Inc., helped finance the launch of his own version of the Enterprise, Spaceship One, the first ever privately funded craft to leave Earth's atmosphere. Now, it can't quite travel at warp speeds of a thousand times faster than light, like the Enterprise, but it's pretty cool. Incredible, isn't it? Star Trek transformed the lives of us all with all its incredible new scientific and engineering concepts. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Well, can I, can I, can I go now? Oh, there's more? Uh, sorry. But where did us Star Trek guys get this technological inspiration from? Did we study for years at the feet of Einstein? Did we have some kind of special foresight into the future? Or were we all just scientific geniuses? Well, no. Uh, the truth about how Star Trek came up with all this world-changing stuff is really quite simple.
What's that, Bill? We made it all up. Are you happy now? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Back at Paramount Studios in Hollywood, we had next to no idea about science or technology. We just wanted to make a cool TV show. But one thing we did know was that if we were going to make people believe in Gene Roddenberry's idea of a better future for mankind, the stuff you guys saw on the TV had to look kind of convincing. Head of Star Trek's Making It All Up department was Gene Roddenberry's right-hand woman, head scriptwriter Dorothy Fontana. Gene Roddenberry had a vision of Star Trek going places that other science fiction shows weren't going. He wanted the technology to look futuristic, not just sound futuristic. In the reality of our real world, we worked on electric typewriters. We didn't even have a really good copy machine until about halfway through the first season. We were dealing with our technology and trying to envision a world that where technology was far greater. And they envisioned some amazing things, like the most famous piece of Star Trek technology of all, the transporter. Surely this was the result of years of creative planning. Uh, not quite. In fact, like most of the stuff in the show, the transporter had been born out of necessity, deadlines, and a meager budget. The transporter was never meant to be in the beginning. We were going to have shuttlecraft, and the company in Phoenix, Arizona, making the big set plus the uh, smaller models didn't deliver on time. So there were at least six or seven episodes that we would not have the shuttlecraft, and therefore we had to find a way to get on and off the ship. Faced with this dilemma, Gene Roddenberry came up with a cunning plan. I know, he said, let's just sort of uh, have them just uh, appear out of kind of nowhere or something. And hey presto, the transporter was born. From its very first episode, Star Trek had attracted attention. I sat back and waited for the fan mail, and boy did it come. The following week, we received the first bag of mail. And then after that, it became bags of mail. More and more and more, so by the end of the, about the first 13 episodes, we were having so much mail that we could not handle it in the office. Letters, a thousand letters, a hundred thousand letters, a million. We were getting very intelligent letters. They weren't all just, please send me a picture. H hang on, these letters weren't for me? There were people in the science community, people in the medical community. Someone wrote in to Gene Roddenberry and said, How do those sliding doors work? The answer was there were two big stagehands pulling them on either side of the doors. Sometimes the stagehands were slow on the cue, so the actors would have to bang right into the door because you had to walk at them with authority, like they were going to open. Despite the prehistoric behind-the-scenes technology, Star Trek's on-screen vision of the future seemed to be catching on. And now we were getting mail from the world of medicine. Stunned by the bits of cardboard and balsa wood, oh, sorry, I mean amazing surgical equipment in the Enterprise sick bay of Dr. McCoy. What happened? Here was a place where diagnosis and surgery was quick and painless and didn't even require a knife. No bleeding. It's a medical miracle. And it was this idea that would help inspire a medical revolution. Real medicine was, of course, a world away from Star Trek in the 1960s and 70s. Should have responded by now. Back then, the diagnosis of many serious illnesses in the human body would often involve messy and dangerous exploratory surgery. Now, through Star Trek, the medical community was offered a tantalizing glimpse of the future. Watching Star Trek in the 1970s, Stanford University Hospital brain surgeon John Adler, then a medical student, realized the Enterprise sick bay was the future. Star Trek just elevated the whole idea. McCoy elevated the whole idea of what we ultimately should be able to do with medicine at a whole new level. 30, 40 years ago, before Star Trek came out, we had only the most primitive understanding of where a tumor was inside the patient's body. As a matter of fact, it was a very common thing to do a big operation on a patient, open their skull, look inside, and find nothing. His brain is gone. So it was that kind of hopelessness, that inability of physicians to understand why this problem was suffering in the first place, that led to this revolution in modern imaging that was presaged by Bones' sickbay. 
Dr. Adler and the medical world had been inspired by Star Trek. The key to the future was clear, developing non-invasive Star Trek-style imaging technology, just like McCoy's medical tricorder. A wonder device that sort of uh, sensed things and then uh, sort of tricorded them or uh, something. The idea that McCoy could just you know, wave the tricorder over your patient and in a non-invasive and really pretty trivial manner make a diagnosis was just almost unthinkable. The medical tricorder could quickly diagnose everything from a chest infection to uh, waxwork itis. They're like waxworks figures. But what dumbfounded doctors didn't realize was the truth behind their beloved tricorder. The 23rd century medical sensors were in fact salt shakers. Now, they weren't meant to be used in a scene as normal salt shakers. Who do you think you are? Until Gene Roddenberry decided they could be recycled to save the prop department a few bucks. Little did he realize they would become the most influential kitchen condiments of all time. McCoy's Star Trek medical magic soon shook up the medical world. Oh, and got salt all over the lens. Um, McCoy was really worth his salt. <laughs> I got salt all over the lens again. I got a lot of jokes. Uh, I, uh, you know, salt shakers and... Uh, um, do you want to do another joke? Today, we take non-invasive diagnosis like CAT scans and MRI for granted. But now, even surgery itself is heading towards being a lot more Trek and non-invasive, too. And it's here Trek fan Adler is playing his part. He's invented the CyberKnife, a computer-controlled robotic device that emits a laser beam that can painlessly and effortlessly remove cancers in the human body without as much as a knife or a slice. Beam the tumor, Tony. Literally during treatment, hundreds of beams of radiation are all passing through this tumor and in the process delivering a destructive dose of radiation that's very accurately deposited in the tumor and destroying it. Not quite as cool as the tricorder, but we're getting there. Wow, isn't it amazing to think that Star Trek accomplished all that? Even inspiring top doctors to change the world? Even more amazing when you consider they just made it all up off the top of our heads. But hey, it was the 60s and anything seemed possible. not have had the USS Enterprise or warp drive, but lots of what Star Trek had predicted did happen. By the 1980s, the future was almost here, and Star Trek had changed the world. But although much of its technology may have been here, Star Trek itself, though, was long gone. Cancelled. Yes, cancelled back in 1969. Scrapped by the network after just three Without Star Trek, the universe became a desolate void for countless eons. Until, in the high-tech 1980s, it was reborn as an all-new TV series called Star Trek The Next Generation. This new Star Trek would attract a new generation of dedicated fans. People like the scary guy. And him. The show would lead to a whole new bunch of inventions like the iPod and beam a whole new generation into the weird world of the Trek. But as the public began to have a few slight issues with rampant technology, Star Trek would dabble in the dark side of the future.
got to find ourselves a location. Location, location, location. It's everything. Stop! I see it. That's the one right there. It's got mystery. It's got, it's very tricky. Come on, this is the one. Definitely not drugs or intoxication. Could be some form of space madness we've never heard of. Okay, so we're, ah, where did we get to? Yes. We saw how Star Trek, a low-budget science fiction show from the 1960s, had changed the whole world. Now, like many of you, I thought, Trek changed people's lives. Come on. They'll have to prove it. But it's true. It really did. Yep, the adventures of the Enterprise sparked a technological revolution as a generation of spotty herberts, geeks, nerds, and spots were inspired to change the world and make it more like their favorite TV show. It was all going rather well, but then... Disaster struck. In 1969, the greatest science fiction show in history was just getting into its spandex stride when it was canceled. Scotty, we haven't got much time left. <laughs> the dream was over. And it looked as though Star Trek's world-changing days were behind it. But guess what? They weren't. Suddenly, in 1979, the Enterprise was back, and this time, on the big screen. Paramount Studios launched a blockbuster movie called Star Trek The Motion Picture. The film was a huge success, grossing $140 million worldwide and paving the way for six more movies. And that was just the beginning. The movies were so successful that in 1987, Paramount decided to give Gene Roddenberry, the creator of the original Star Trek, a go at bringing Star Trek back, at last, to the small screen. Roddenberry was determined that Star Trek, the next generation, would do what the first series had done and change planet Earth with his rose-tinted vision of the perfect future. But repeating the wow factor of the first series was not going to be easy. After all, things had changed. In the two decades since the original Star Trek, the world had moved on. Technology had advanced, and much of that stuff that so amazed us in the first series were now part of our everyday lives. This was the 80s. Audiences were much more sophisticated when it came to science and technology. And a show full of sliding doors, wobbly sets, and glowing jelly beans would no longer be seen as the pinnacle of mankind's progress. To maintain the rich tradition of the original Star Trek, the next generation would have to do some astonishing things. It would have to change our culture. Yes, sir. Our technology. Sorry, sir. Change people's lives. No change, sir. Change the world. No problem. Could they do it? Don't ask me, I haven't read the script yet. From now on, the Star Trek team would be involved in a relentless struggle to keep their technology ahead of their audience. But first, what about the cast? Why is there a bald guy called Jean-Luc Picard sitting in my captain's chair? Um, hello? I don't want excuses, number one, I want answers. Did these Enterprise learner drivers think they had a chance of becoming loved by TV audiences like me and, oh, well, what's his name, with the ears? audition for Next Generation, I was one of the only people in the world who knew nothing about the original Star Trek, or very little about it. I had no idea that it was part of the popular culture, so I went out and rented all the videotapes about Kirk and Spock and McCoy and watched the episodes. Like most humans, I seem to have an instinctive revulsion to reptiles. At that point, I realized that we were trying to reinvent something that was incredibly important to a lot of people. 
Yeah, it sure was. Jonathan was being transported from his normal life into the crazy world of the Trek. As Commander Riker, the second in command of the Enterprise, All hands to battle stations laying a course. Engage warp nine. He would spend the next few years doing all the usual life-enhancing Star Trek stuff, like getting blown up, wobbled around, making space omelets, playing with his instrument, and generally impressing the ladies. His life had changed forever, but Frakes could never quite lose the sense that Star Trek was just another cheap science fiction show. In the darkest night of the soul, sleepwalking, he'd wonder, what have we gotten ourselves into? We're wearing polyester spacesuits. We go to a planet once a week. It's filled with smoke and dirt. And we talk to people with silly heads on. What kind of work is this? Ah, but all the humiliation and the polyester would be worth it because as Roddenberry made clear, Star Trek was so much more than just sci-fi. Next Generation became a continuation of his great campaign to change the world. Roddenberry said, in the 24th century, and he really, he believed this, and he, because he believed it, we believed it. He said, in the 24th century, there will be no hunger, and there will be no greed, and all the children will know how to read. So I've quoted him for saying that for many, many years. In fact, Next Generation was initially even more optimistic about mankind's progress than the original Star Trek had been. Whilst Captain Kirk's approach to foreign policy was generally this, Captain. Captain Picard favored more diplomatic methods. We mean you no harm. The Klingons, once our ugly enemy, were now part of the Enterprise crew within phaser range in 30 seconds. Even though they were now even more ugly. Sounds crazy. It's not crazy at all. And just to make sure there weren't any pent up bad feelings or funny mental hang ups, <laughs> Roddenberry even made sure there was an onboard therapist, a caring alien who could sense emotions and communicate using her mind. Hmm, I've got a few thoughts of my own. Let's see if she can sense these. <laughs> I'm sensing a, a powerful mind. Yeah, forget about it. I'll stick with the good old spoken word for the rest of the show. Yep, Next Generation's band of intergalactic adventurers seem to be doing a good job. Bridge to Riker, urgent. But it took a bit of time for audiences to adjust to this new cast and their funny ways, some more than most. Walter Koenig had starred as Chekhov in the original Star Trek. Captain, we are in deep trouble. He was rather proud of his place in TV history, and he wasn't too keen on sharing his glory with anyone. Captain, when Next Generation first went on the air, my initial response was to hope that it would fail. I admit to that with some uh, embarrassment. There was a sense of rejection involved, that we were being discarded, uh, when, we would, when we would most surely be forgotten within a very brief period of time. That was my sense. It looked like our time had passed. But slowly, audiences, me, even old Walt, were one round to the next generation's magic. The show was far more cerebral than ours was. I don't think it was as dynamic. I don't think it was as theatrical. But certainly the acting was, it was terrific, and I thought the directing and the, and the writing was excellent. So I got over that whole feeling, and I was pleased with it. It took us probably the better part of the whole first season to win the real hardcore Trekkies over. They realized there was room in their hearts for Captain Picard as well as Captain Kirk for a new enterprise. The audience from the original show began to enjoy us, I hope, and we found a brand new audience because obviously it was, it was 20 years later. It was looking good, but a new crew alone was not enough to change the world, oh no. To do that, Next Generation would have to stun legions of geeks with a dazzling array of inspirational science and technology. So Star Trek issued a grand decree, make the technology on Next Generation so amazing that it would blow the mind of tech freak geeks everywhere. 
Now who better to impress geeks than more geeks? That's why Star Trek hired these guys. NASA physicist Andre Bomanis and technical designer Rick Sternbeck. Andre and Rick were sent by Roddenberry to comb the science libraries and the geeky model kit shops of Southern California to find ways of updating all the cool computerized thingamajigs that had proven so wowy in the original Star Trek. Together they'd use their nerd knowledge to try and make the tech both more scientifically respectable and kind of uh, futuristic-y looking. The audience for the show had become a lot more sophisticated. They expected a higher level of credibility in terms of the science and technical language in the show. And a lot of the audience consisted of scientists and engineers. And so we had to make sure that when we described our fictional science and technology in the future, that it had a certain credibility to it. We saw the explosion of personal electronics starting to outrace us. CD players, uh, DVD players were on the horizon. Uh, you know, the cell phones were getting smaller. How do you, how do you convince the audience that what they're looking at is 400 years in the future. That's tough. Now, filled with excitement, Rick and Andre set to work on their big challenge to update all that iconic Star Trek technology and make us all fall in love with it. Next Generation very definitely wanted to get across the notion that we should be comfortable with high technology. You know, this, this was not something that we should be afraid of. Yeah, one of the things that I had to do is really try to keep abreast of all of the new developments in science and technology, not just in astronomy and physics, but in biology and medicine and anything I could basically get my hands on. So I read a lot of journals, I subscribed to various magazines, trying to keep ahead of what do we know now that we didn't know a few years ago. Soon Rick and Andre unleashed their new designs on the world. In the year of the brick-sized cell phone, the communicator became a hands-free, trendy brooch. The tricorder, once an albatross hanging around Spock's neck, was smaller, more powerful, and portable than ever. And had lots more lights and beeping noises and stuff. Whereas food on the original Enterprise had looked as though it was delivered by a system of strings and pulleys, Next Generation had menus stored in computer systems to be beamed down at your convenience. A kind of transporter system for sandwiches. And even the sliding doors had a new sound. All this made the new Star Trek seem less old-fashioned, but could it feel truly futuristic? Of course it could. Meet the Enterprise's first fully technological crew member, the universe's most advanced and irritatingly self-righteous computerized robot thing, Commander Data. My skull is composed of cortonide and geranium. Although made of new polymers and genetically modified something. Wow. Data spent a lot of his time trying to make up his mind if he was human or non-human. We are more alike than unlike, my dear Captain. Which meant experimenting with facial hair. Mm, getting into fights. He knew everything about everything. If our phaser discharge is off by as little as 0 0.06 terawatts, it would cause a cascading exothermal inversion. Meaning? And luckily, he had a huge hard drive, which went down rather well with the ladies. I am programmed in multiple techniques. <sighs> Data became a hit. But could he and the rest of Andre and Rick's new tech ideas do what the old Star Trek had done? Inspire geeks and change the world? I reckon they could. It's my favorite um, Star Trek series. I actually think that they found a really nice balance between what was comprehensible to an audience back then and something which was just a little bit further ahead. This is Steve Perlman. 
man who dreams that one day we will all live in perfect harmony with computers, just like on board the Enterprise. For the last 20 years, Steve has been at the forefront of computer technology in Silicon Valley, California. His success all started back in the late 80s, when he was a principal scientist at Apple Computers, wondering what to do to make computers do stuff. And then one night, he swept away his hair and watched, you guessed it, the next generation. These guys were dreaming of stuff that wasn't obvious and showing how it could be used. Now, they didn't know how to make a computer do this and how to figure out how to, all the logistics of it, of course. I mean, that's our job. <laughs> now, Steve was about to be inspired when something Star Trek invented caught his eye. Back then, Data was listening to many copies of music simultaneously played for the speakers. Mozart's Jupiter Symphony in C major, Molto Vivace, and La Donna e Mobile. The idea that he could call up any music he wanted on the computer in the Enterprise was a novel idea. Computer, eliminate program two. Now the music Data was listening to was effectively gazillions of megabytes of information and yet was able to be accessed at the touch of a button. Hmm, seems simple to us now, but back then there was a slight problem. It was impossible. I remember in 1987, we were about to introduce the Macintosh 2, and it was really the first personal computer that had stereo output. It sounds so trivial now, but it took an entire disc of the largest disc made just to play one single in stereo and it took a state-of-the-art computer the day it was released in 1987. Hmm, there was a bit of a problem. So what did Steve do about it? Simple. Inspired by Star Trek, he helped develop a kind of software which allowed everyone to be as irritating and as noisy as Data, store up all their favorite tunes on their computers, and then access them any time. That software would, within a few years, become a part of nearly every single home computer in the world. That software is called QuickTime, a multimedia miracle that allows computers to digitally compress, store, and play all kinds of movie and audio files. Which beats carrying your record collection around in an old paper bag. But it didn't stop there. Steve's software would pave the way for the invention of a few small toys that few people really thought would take off. First the MP3, and then a revolutionary music player that would transform the fortunes of Apple and be bought by 30 million people in just four years. Something called the iPod. Am I talking? Am I talking too loud? Are we okay? Steve's various inventions have so far earned him many millions of dollars, so you'd think after all that, you'd think he would be taking it easy. Or maybe not. We were very excited about creating ubiquitous computing, getting audio on computers, getting video playing with QuickTime. But meanwhile, we were watching Star Trek Next Generation, and we were seeing something much more interesting than that called the holodeck. The holodeck was a great big empty area of the ship, which during your day off, you could download any scenario you fancied from the ship's computer and become part of it. The vial was placed in his hand after he died. Why don't you come on in and take a look at my holodeck. Today, Steve is convinced that he can make the holodeck a reality. I'm going to regret this. And that's why he's developing a sophisticated motion capture system that feeds information from retroflective beads positioned on a subject's body into a computer that can then recreate a perfect 3D image of it in some imaginary world. One day, we will all entertain ourselves like this, according to Steve. Can't wait. <laughs> Yes, thanks to the effort of Star Trek's army of writers and designers like Rick and Andre, Next Generation were succeeding in inspiring the world of technology just like the original show had done.
But the problem was, every time Star Trek wowed an audience, the audience wanted more. The questions from the Trek's geeky fans were flowing in, and Rick and Andre were forced to do yet more research and answer all those great Star Trek questions. How much energy would you need to create a warp drive? What's the role of dilithium in all of this? Where would the power come from? How does a transporter work? How are you going to make sure that you reassemble people in the same order that you took them apart so that they come back in one piece? How does this work? All of these things were interesting questions to the more technically oriented fans on the show. Soon the next generation tried to give an answer for everything and were keeping audiences on the edge of their seats with gripping dialogue like this. A Dyson sphere. In the 20th century, a physicist called Freeman Dyson postulated the theory that an enormous hollow sphere could be constructed around a star. The new brainy approach was working, and soon even the most hardcore of scientists, the physicists, were taking the show seriously. One episode of The Next Generation was even graced by the presence of the universe's most famous brain box, the real life Stephen Hawking. Wrong again, Albert. But the physicists weren't content just to give the show their stamp of approval. Just like the geeks, they were mesmerized by the show, and now they would try to make it come true. Back in the 1960s, when Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry was first dreaming up his vision of life in the 23rd century, he instantly hit a little problem. How was the Enterprise going to travel vast distances around the universe? They already had the transporter system, but that was only used for local travel, like getting from the ship to a nearby asteroid. No, for those big journeys, the Enterprise needed to have some serious horsepower under the hood. So, he randomly made up warp drive. Warp factor eight. A mighty engine that allowed the Enterprise to burn rubber at many times the speed of light. That's 700 million miles per hour to you and me. Of course, we all know that traveling faster than the speed of light is impossible in the real world. Why? Because Einstein said so, that's why. Yeah, in his old theory of relativity, which even I've heard of, it clearly states that only light itself can travel at light speed and nothing in the universe could ever, ever travel any faster. Jeez, for someone with such cool hair, he was just not a fun guy. And as a great man once said, I can't change the laws of physics. But wait, what's this? Well, this is the renowned Mexican physicist, Miguel Acubert. He has a crazy theory that Star Trek had got it right and light speeds are possible. Strange, he doesn't look like a lunatic. And one day I was watching an episode of Star Trek and I started wondering if it would be possible to actually travel faster than light using some kind of warp drive within the realms of, the, of physics, within relativity theory. And I actually had the idea that it was possible, so I went back to the office and started doing some calculations. And very quickly I realized that one can actually do the math and show that it is possible to travel faster than light. But how could it be possible? I mean, Einstein has spoken, right? Well, the thing about Star Trek is that it had the mysterious power to make a lot of very clever people devote their lives to making its vision come true. And theoretical physicists with big brains like Miguel are no exception. He has devoted a lot of his career to making warp drive a reality. Okay, so Miguel hasn't actually got a four billion ton galaxy class starship. So to demonstrate how warp drive works, we've got the next best thing. According to Alcubierre, to understand warp drive, we need to completely rethink the way a spacecraft gets from A to B. The Enterprise travels through the galaxy much faster than the speed of light. And people's perception is usually that it just travels very, very fast through space. Yeah, so we travel across the galaxy, getting from A to B, using some serious forward motion. I'm with you so far, Miguel, carry on. What the Enterprise, in fact, does is travel through the galaxy without moving. It would sit there inside a bubble of distorted space. The space behind the Enterprise would expand very quickly, and the space in front of the Enterprise would contract very quickly. And in this way, the Enterprise would be pushed by space itself from one place to another. 
Uh, hang on. So the Enterprise doesn't move, and the space warps around it to form a bubble, contracting in front of it and expanding behind it, pulling the ship along. Before you get too excited about warp drive, consider this. It may be theoretically possible, to, if Miguel is right, and lots of people think he's not. But it turns out that even Miguel admits that warping space-time would require rather a lot of energy, the equivalent to, say, a billion suns, as Miguel will now explain. You cannot just distort space any which way you want. Uh, you need the distribution of matter and energy to create that. So if you go through the math and see what kind of energy you would need to create a warp, a warp bubble, you figure out that it's a very strange type of energy. In, it's something we hey, call... uh, Miguel, you know what? I just remembered I got a, uh, I, uh, I got a thing, a meeting. I got a... So uh, just uh, keep up the good work. Ciao. So maybe warp speed travel might be a bit tricky, but the point is that Star Trek The Next Generation was inspiring guys like Miguel to think big. And he wasn't alone. This is the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton, New Jersey, a place that is officially home to the world's brainiest people. It's the place where Einstein used to hang out and play with his hair. Here, resident physicists like Dr. Lawrence Krauss were watching The Next Generation and starting to realize that Star Trek and some of the loftiest goals of science were strangely linked. The mission of the Enterprise, its five-year mission, is to, is to go out, literally, and find out what's possible in the universe. And of course, that's exactly, for me, what science is all about. It's why I do what I, I do and why most of my colleagues uh, who are here in this building right now are doing physics, because they're interested in what's possible in the universe. In love with the Trek, Krauss decided to write a book examining in detail just how the physics of Star Trek would actually work. In his book, Lawrence analyzed everything from warp drive to tractor beams, subspace sensors, the holodeck, and photon torpedoes. But there was one thing in particular, the most iconic piece of Star Trek technology of all, that Krauss was most keen to tackle, the transporter. What seduced me into writing the physics of Star Trek in the first place is a transporter, because I travel in airplanes a lot, and I hate it, and I'd love to be transported from one place to another. Now, according to Rick and Andre and the Next Generation writers, the transporter works by breaking your body down into individual atoms, storing them on a computer, and kind of emailing them onto another computer before putting your body back together again. Simple. But as Krauss discovered, doing all this presented a few slight problems. If I wanted to disassemble you into individual elementary particles, I'd probably have to heat your body up to about 100 million degrees. Just to scan you and store the information is incredibly daunting. Take a 100 gigabyte hard drive. Well, not one wouldn't do it. You'd have to stack them from here a third of the way to the center of the Milky Way galaxy. 10,000 light years worth of 100 gigabyte hard drives. Whoa, so if all that wasn't bad enough, there was one even bigger reason why Krauss thought the transporter was completely impossible. It totally defied one of the cornerstones of quantum physics. So what is it, Mr. Know-it-all? The Heisenberg uncertainty principle from quantum mechanics. And that says that even with the best microscope in the world, you can never know where every atom is in your body and precisely what it's doing at the same time. You can know, either know where it is or what it's doing, but not both. There's no margin for error. One atom out of place and poof, you never come back. Energize. Hmm, so with the crazy world of quantum physics to contend with, surely Rick and Andre and the Next Generation team had been caught out. Oh, ye of little faith. You see, Star Trek had made sure that the problems presented by the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle were overcome by outfitting all the transporters with nifty little gadgets called Heisenberg Compensators. That made sure everyone got beamed from point A to point B in one piece. Transporting really is the safest way to travel. How did it work? Nobody knows. Okay, so the transporter may have been one idea too far for the real world of physics, but as Krauss soon discovered, the next generation writers were onto something with another of Enterprise's travel techniques. They were using a cheeky physics phenomena called wormholes. 
Wormholes, according to the experts, are a strange breach in the fabric of space and time that can act as both a shortcut through the universe and as a way of traveling back and forth through time itself. And Lawrence has popped around to help me rustle one up. Lawrence, I was just narrating about you. Isn't that amazing? Come here. It's Lawrence Krauss, top physicist. What are the chances of that? It's in the script, Bill. No. Laurie, it's me acting. This is called acting. I'm, I'm sorry, I should have okay. known. I'm, I'm sorry. Please. Hello, welcome to Cooking with Bill. And today we're going to illustrate a wormhole cooking pizza. And cooking with us is Lawrence Krauss, who is cooking without Bill. <laughs> well, Bill, I hope you're going to help here. Uh, I'll what do we, the best I can, Lawrence. What we're going to try and do today is illustrate the concept of a wormhole, which is, of course, of vital importance for traveling through space. Think of these pizzas as universes. I okay. These. I'll put the stars. Why don't you put the galaxies in? Here's a galaxy here, a galaxy there. Okay, now what a wormhole is, is a shortcut through space. If you were an ant to go from here to there, you'd have no choice but to crawl around. Long journey. Now, let's get really serious about physics for a second. As we know, traveling across the universe takes ages, even in the Enterprise. But why travel across it when you can bend space and time to just cruise through the middle of it? And that's what a wormhole allows you to do. I'm not sure if ours will, though. You can help make the wormhole. Yes. If you want to cut a piece off yes. there and make a wormhole. Here we go. Yeah, just roll it up in okay. a wormhole. Okay, roll it up. Rolling. There you go. Hold the end. Ooh, that feels so good. There you go. Okay, I no, 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 no. Don't play with the wormhole. Okay, just, look. now what you've just done, you've created a wormhole. It's, You're kidding. It's amazing. If, it's all pointless unless you have the Enterprise to go through the wormhole and come out the other end. We don't have the Enterprise, but we do have anchovies. And the anchovy is the Enterprise. Yeah, yeah, that's all I have, There's Sorry. something fishy about that. Oh, well. So there it is. Having conquered the worlds of science and technology, it looked like Star Trek would just keep on inspiring the world forever. It won award after award, and ratings were huge. But then, a crisis. Two things happened that would forever alter the course of the USS Enterprise. First, Gene Roddenberry died in 1991. And as a fitting tribute, NASA launched his ashes into space. Star Trek's creator was gone, and so was his uncomplicated and optimistic vision of the future. Star Trek's next problem was the changing mood of the public, which was now becoming harder to ignore. In the 1990s, the Star Trek's scientific optimism was starting to look a little outdated. Suddenly, we were scared of the monster that progress had created. Genetically modified crops, the ozone layer, the Y2K bug, computer viruses, Chernobyl, globalization, global warming, cell phone brain tumors, CCTV watching our every move. Ah, enough already. You get the point, right? People were worried. And what do people do when they get worried? Well, some of Star Trek viewers were about to get mad. Let me talk to you. You see that scary looking man down there? His name is Kirk Patrick Sale, and he's what they call a neo-Luddite, which means he doesn't like technology very much. And I don't mean he is just an occasional altercation with an alarm clock. I mean, he doesn't like technology at all. Hmm, gonna hide now. And what's even scarier is that he believes that all our trust in technology was all Star Trek's fault. Well, that's sort of the, the, the Trekkie vision, I, I would say, that uh, technology is, is positive. Yes. It is the wellspring of science that there should be no limits. Right. That's always been the idea. There, nothing can limit us, and especially you get American science. Nothing can limit us. We can do anything we want. This is madness. This is foolhardy. I doubt that. Suppose, for example, that the people who are working on creating a black hole in a laboratory in uh, Seattle, Washington, were successful. 
It's crazy. They were they were just testing it out to see what they. But suppose they created a black hole. Everything goes into I me. Mean, that's a that's a uh, a disaster, a worldwide disaster. Okay, so maybe we weren't all as mad as Mr. Sale, but as the millennium approached, the public was having problems with the very things that made the Trek so good. Hope in the future and scientific and technological progress. This gave Star Trek a cunning plan. They were about to show fans a future that was full of fear, anxiety, and political intrigue, a place where technology never saved the day. In the 1990s, the next generation's writers introduced Star Trek viewers to a new dark vision of the future of humanity, a world where technology isn't the solution, it's the problem. Cue the Borg. An enhanced humanoid. The Borg are the dark side of technology. They're what happens if technology falls into the wrong hands and goes awry and is used to dehumanize rather than let us all live to our full potential. <laughs> Once human like us, the Borg had become one with their technology which now controlled them. Stripped of their individuality, these techno zombies were now part of a collective network on a vast computer system and controlled telepathically by the evil, mysterious, and strangely sexy Borg Queen. I think one of the reasons that the Borg have such great resonance is that in effect, in today's world, we are the Borg. I mean, at least to a degree. We would be helpless without our technology. Yes, it was all very unpleasant and scary, but not everyone thought so. In fact, over in England, there's a man who is actually trying to turn us all into Borg. In terms of evolution, humans have come as far as we can go, and the next evolutionary step clearly has to be more of a technological one as we become one with technology. This is Kevin Warwick head of the cybernetics and robotics faculty at Reading University. For years, Kevin was interested in merely building and developing robotic technology until he spotted a certain lady technocrat on the TV. That's right, a visitation from Star Trek changed his life. Now, Kevin and his students may look like a harmless bunch of geeks, but they're far from it. In fact, even as I speak, they are plotting to turn the people of Earth into a race of technologically enhanced drones. That's right. Borg. Oh, dear. You see, for the past few years, Kevin has been working on ways of linking humans directly to the Internet in various scary ways, including having Borg-like implants inside his own body. In 1998, he was able to connect his nervous system to the Internet using a special chip implanted in his arm, which allowed him to use the web to control the movements of a robotic arm. To all intents and purposes, I was a Borg. My nervous system went not only inside my body, but to wherever the Internet took me. So if you think that's scary, just wait until you see what he's planning next. Soon, just like the Borg, we will all be able to communicate telepathically by downloading each other's thoughts and knowledge directly into our brains. There. In 10 to 15 years, my brain will be linked by an implant directly with a computer and onto the internet. So I won't have to control technology by moving my hands, I'll just have to think. And those thought signals will not only control technology, but we'll also communicate with others who are connected into the network. And if you're not upgraded, if you can't think to and with a machine, if you can't communicate just by thinking, you're going to be a bit of a subspecies. You Well, if that's the future, then I think I'm happy being a relic of the past. With the Borg, Star Trek was getting darker and more doubtful of Gene Roddenberry's happy, clappy vision of the future. Soon they would unveil an all-new Star Trek crammed full of even more doubt. Doubt about the future. Doubt about exploration. Doubt about just about everything. So let's meet the doubting Thomas that helped make this possible.
This hard-rocking blue-bearded rebel is Ira Stephen Bear. Ira is a high-powered television executive responsible recently for creating the popular sci-fi series, The 4400. And in Hollywood circles, that means he can do whatever he wants. If he wants to dye his goatee beard blue, he will, damn it. You got a problem with that, punk? Back in the early 1990s, Ira was a writer in the happy, wholesome world of Star Trek, The Next Generation. He absolutely hated it. To him, the sunny and optimistic Star Trek vision of humanity's future was awful. And even the Borg weren't dark enough. When I got there, Star Trek to me was what, as a kid growing up in New York City, I used to think Connecticut was. I thought the 24th century had become Connecticut, which not necessarily purely white, but purely white bread, where people were very satisfied and there were no problems. Well, that all sounds quite nice to me, but I, I guess that was the problem. You see, Ira doesn't do nice, and what irritated him even more than Star Trek's nice people was the show's attitude to future science and technology, which was, you know, nice. The secret message of Star Trek is that basically technology is good. And let me tell you, if that is not the most hopeful message you can possibly give out, I don't know what is, because basically I find that, that as I look around us, computers are changing the way we interact, how we think, how, how, our, our relationships, and, and Star Trek keeps telling us it's okay not to worry. Well, Ira was worried. His toaster had been giving him funny looks, and his cell phone had made fun of his beard. <laughs> and he wanted to take revenge. Soon, Ira would get a chance to put his thoughts into action when he was asked to help develop a new Star Trek series called Deep Space Nine. This new show would be set in the same time period as Next Generation, but that was where the similarities would end. The computers are crashing. Technology on Deep Space Nine, it was, it was alien technology. So at the beginning, it's this the space station, how does it work? Is it booby-trapped? Damn it, what's the problem? Technology as mystery again. Technology as the enemy. Procedure is not recommended. In this vision of the 24th century, humanity was not unlike it is today. A universe of war and suffering where no one was perfect. Even the captain himself was riddled with, yes, you guessed it, doubt. I lied. I cheated. By making the future seem, well, totally depressing, Deep Space Nine had attempted to tap into the new skepticism about our high-tech future. Synthetic flesh. The show won some critical acclaim, but no one was polite enough to point out that a lot fewer people were watching this show than the 20 million people who had watched The Nice Next Generation. One of the problems for the writers was that while audiences may have been wary of technology, that didn't mean they knew nothing about it. People knew their microchips from potato chips and antimatter from combo platter. And so in 1994, in another new series called Voyager, they would try to take Trek tech to the limits, only without all that nasty testosterone. This new Star Trek was kind of a bit like the old Star Treks before it, but with a twist. They had even more newfangled science and technology. Subspace transponder. Tachyokinetic energy. Dimensional distortion. Graviton flux. And a tough, no-nonsense female captain. Battle stations. Wow, did they really have a, a female captain? Things really had changed, I mean, in my day. I don't want to hear it. Star Trek women were in short skirts, and well, I remember one girl, she was Really, in a short skirt, it was... In fact, you would call them panties. They were really... It's like a thong, really. Wow. 
with Voyager scripts packed full of techno babble. Try remodulating the shield harmonics. Its skipper, played by actress Kate Mulgrew, had more to worry about than underwear. She would soon discover that mastering the supercalifragilistic tongue twisting trek turn of phrase was a bit tricky. We need to focus on those vacuoles, identical to the ambient radiation in the asteroid field. I got the role on a Thursday and started on Monday. I had two seconds to pull myself together. It was wild. Jane made engineering. Bellana, what's going on? I didn't have time to think about much of anything except can I learn this Japanese overnight because that's what it felt like. Perform another subspace scan. This time extend the scan radius to 10 AU. I mean, it's fantastic language. It's, 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 it's very unwieldy. It's, it's sort of Shakespearean in its bigness. I mean, try to get your mouth around some of those terms. That's what we're trying to figure out. For you to understand me, recalibrate your deflector to emit an anti-tachyon pulse. I have to understand it myself. But just how daunting and difficult to understand was all this scientific technobabble on Voyager? To find out, I've made physicist Lawrence Krauss stay up for three nights straight watching Voyager episodes. Hey, Larry, what's happening? Well, Bill, you know, I've discovered that as well as employing new technologies such as bioneural computers and ablative shielding, the USS Voyager was able to experiment with several new warp drive variants. One was a quantum slipstream drive, which by combining a quantum matrix with a small amount of benamite crystals, was able to make the Voyager reach a billion times light speed. That was, of course, until someone discovered a 0.42 phase variance in the slipstream, which amazingly... Bill. Bill. Hmm, you see, like Deep Space Nine, Voyager's mix of scary scripts and a darker future didn't really catch on with television audiences, and the ratings continued to decline. And worse was to come. In 2005, Star Trek's latest incarnation called Enterprise was canceled after ratings finally hit the floor. The problem, of course, is that Star Trek had moved away from Gene Roddenberry's original message, which stated quite clearly that in the future, human beings would live in something approaching perfect harmony, and that this would be possible because of our technical brilliance and lots of cool inventions. Paramount Studios now says they've killed off the TV show for good. Yes, it looks like Star Trek may have reached the final bit right at the end of the final frontier. All right, everybody, back to your posts. Let's get out of here. But hey, don't fret. The point is that it hasn't really gone. Star Trek is all around us and all that science and technology we take for granted today, from cell phones to computers to MP3 players to space travel and modern medicine. And forevermore, when people need inspiration, when they need to be reminded of just how cool the future could be, Star Trek will be there. So there you have it. The epic story of how a humble science fiction show changed the world. Today it may be gone, but Star Trek oh, will live I on forever. A lawsuit here. I don't know what the... Um, what is going I'm so on sorry. here? Excuse you you want to turn that we're off? We're shooting Please. a Please documentary. We don't Who need any lawyers. Are you? Well, I'm William you Shatner. Walk in William to Shatner, any house? Star Trek. Oh, well, right, T that Trekkie guy. Yeah. Well, okay, what, does Hooker? this look like the Enterprise to no, you? No, no, no. Of course. Have you got any money? I don't have any money on me. If you've got any money, I, please, ma'am, I don't... I think you are. I, I, uh, you think you can do this, No, huh? I don't think I Just can do this. Just because you're what? You? Some Star Trek uh, guy? Well, I mean, Star Trek's pretty popular, you know. It is, huh? Yes. And, and well, you know what? This is 2005. You're very aggressive. I, 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 you're tall and you're blonde and you're beautiful. You yeah? are what beautiful. What do you mean tonight? Not too much. Can I stand on the higher ground here? Look at this. Look at the difference this makes. You see this? See what a difference this <laughs> it does. is? Uh, you know, so I've been right, meaning yeah. to talk to you. You talking to me? You talking to me? You calling me? Has been? Has been? Was? Has been? Might again?